thank you for coming. Thank you to all the media who are here. Uh, thank you to KFK Radio Greeley for covering this live and for all those folks who are listening uh, out over the internet and on the radio. I'm David Kopel, the research director of the Independence Institute and the attorney for the sheriffs in this civil rights case which is being filed today in federal district court. Today we'd like to uh, have the plaintiffs in this case, the 54 sheriffs and the other <coughs> peaceable good citizens and organizations of Colorado who are bringing the civil rights lawsuit explain why they're doing so. But before I do that, before we bring them on individually, I'd like to just recognize the 18 sheriffs who took the time to come all the way from all over the state, from the metro area, from the west slope, from the plains, from the south, and from the north, sometimes traveling many, many hours uh, to be here to stand up for law and order and for the rights of the citizens of Colorado. So I don't mind. Uh, the, the sheriffs that are here with us today are Ken Putnam of Cheyenne County, Jim Fall of Prowers County, Fred McKee of Delta County, Louis Valerio, Lou Valerio of Garfield County, Rick Dunlap of Montrose County, Tom Nestor of Lincoln County, Tom Ridnour of Kit Carson County, Dennis Spruill of Montezuma County, Justin Smith of Larimer County, Jim Biker of Fremont County, Chad Day of Yuma County, John Cook of Weld County, Brian Norton of Rio Grande County, Larry Kuntz of Washington County, David Weaver of Douglas County, Terry Makita of El Paso County, Randy Peck of Sedgwick County, and Bruce Hartman of Gilpin County. And of course, there are 36 additional sheriffs uh, who weren't able to be here today, but who have stood up and stepped forward to be the plaintiffs in this case, standing for the rights of the citizens of Colorado against unjust invasions. And so now I'd like to bring on first uh, Weld County Sheriff John Cook. He is also the past president of County Sheriffs of Colorado and currently vice president of the Western State Sheriffs. Thank you, Dave. Good morning. I'm Will County Sheriff John Cook. And I'm here today actually with uh, mixed emotions. On one hand, I'm proud to be a part of this historic case. Proud to stand with 53 of my fellow elected sheriffs who willingly put their name on this lawsuit because they took an oath to uphold the Constitution. Really, on the other hand, it really saddens me that we have to even be here today at all. It never should have come to this. It never should have got to this point in the first place. It's a shame that the sheriffs women's groups, disabled shooters, and business owners had to band together and sue the state to protect the right that the founders guaranteed to us in our Constitution. For me, this lawsuit is about two things. First, upholding the Constitution, which I took an oath to defend, just like the other 53 sheriffs. But it's also about public safety. These bills do absolutely nothing to make Colorado a safer place to live, to work, to play, or to raise a family. Instead, these misguided unconstitutional bills will have the opposite effect because they greatly restrict the right of decent, law-abiding citizens to defend themselves, their families, and their homes. Public safety is about establishing priorities and allocating resources. The sheriff's priorities and resources are focused on catching the murderers, rapists, child molesters, drug dealers, burglars, in other words, the evil element in our society, not the law-abiding citizen whom these bills target. Furthermore, supporters of these bills put law enforcement in an impossible situation because there is no way to enforce them. From the perspective of the sheriffs, this legislature had an agenda rather than good public policy in mind when they rushed these bills through. And in their rush to pass new laws, they didn't bother listening to the people charged with enforcing them. We tried telling the governor, but he wouldn't even meet with us. We tried telling the state legislators, but a narrow majority of them refused to even listen. The governor signed the bills knowing how bad they were. In a recent radio interview, the governor even admitted that the magazine bill would be nearly impossible for law enforcement to enforce, yet he signed it anyway. If these were good and enforceable bills, why would the governor have to announce at the time of their signing that he would order the creation of a guidance suggesting to law enforcement that they refrain 
from enforcing the actual statutory language of House Bill 1224 and 1229. This isn't good public policy. These are really awful bills. They are unenforceable and encourage disrespect for the law, which puts both law enforcement and the public in greater danger. Now some in the media have asked me if I think it's a good idea or if it's appropriate for a government official to sue another government official. My response is unequivocally yes. It is our duty and responsibility as sheriffs to protect the people who elected us and to whom we serve. And to quote the renowned Jewish rabbi, Hilla, it is not uh, if not us, who? If not now, when? But do not assume, however, that this lawsuit is about party affiliation, because it's not. We have sheriffs from both sides. We have both Republicans and Democrats joining the suit. It is also not about urban versus rural, like the governor likes to portray, as we have both rural and metro sheriffs signing on as plaintiffs. It's about the Constitution. It's about the Second and Fourteenth Amendments. The suit is about our way of life, our freedoms, our rights, and our liberties, which transcend political affiliation and place of residence. Whether you live in Julesburg or Denver, Rocky Ford or Aurora, Nucla or Colorado Springs, this lawsuit is for your rights and for your safety. Thank you. Besides the constitutional issues in this case of the Second and Fourteenth, Fourteenth Amendments, the civil rights lawsuit also raises claims under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So now I'd like to present Dylan Harrell, uh, who is one of uh, the dis disabled plaintiffs in this lawsuit and also uh, a member of Outdoor Buddies, which is Colorado's leading organization that enables people who have some disabilities to participate in the outdoor sports. Dylan? Hi, my name is Dylan Harrell and I'm a plaintiff in the, in the case being brought today. I'm a Colorado resident, born and raised, who also happens to have a disability, which makes it more difficult for me to defend myself and my family, which include two small children. As an outdoorsman, I also often request the assistance in the safe handling of my firearms anytime I'm transferring from my wheelchair to an ATV or another vehicle. I have firearms for the purpose of defending my family that uh, they use magazines that are now made illegal by House Bill 1224. I also have firearms for sporting uses. They use magazines that are made illegal by House Bill 1224. Um, this makes it against the law for me to even seek assistance now in the handling of my firearms anytime I'm transferring into or out of my wheelchair. I'm taking part of the, in this case today because House Bill 1224 violates my Second Amendment rights and also the rights of all Coloradans, including and especially other Coloradans with disabilities such as my own. Our next speaker is Catherine Whitney, the uh, president of Women for Concealed Carry, and I'd also like to thank uh, some of the members of her organization who, and we step forward, uh, the mem some of the members of her organization who came here uh, in support of her to stand up with her. daughters, wives, and mothers. We are professionals, students, veterans, and stay-at-home moms. We are survivors of sexual assault and violent crime. We want to protect our bodies, our lives, and our children. And the United States Constitution recognizes our ability to do that. At its core, the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to self-defense. This is a fundamental right and a right that House Bills 1224 and 1229 violate. Women for Concealed Carry is a nonprofit organization committed to preserving innocent life. We advocate for a woman's ability to determine how to defend herself and her family. We are committed to working with lawmakers to ensure all laws allow women meaningful defense options when confronted with evil. The ease with which the governor and state, the state legislature dismissed our safety concerns is troubling. 
We believe House Bills 1224 and 1229 unconstitutionally restrict a woman's right to self-defense. So today we ask the court to declare these bills void. For the sake of our lives and the lives of our young children, we ask the court to issue injunctions against the enforcement of these dangerous bills. Briefly, I will describe why House Bill 1224 is so dangerous for women in Colorado. According to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, forcible rapes are becoming more and more common in the state. Last year, there were 2,236 forcible rapes reported in Colorado. And this number does not include those that went unreported, as most do. As women, we do not carry concealed handguns because we think we will be attacked or raped by a stranger. We carry because we already have been or don't want to be. House Bill 1224 will make it much more difficult for a woman to defend herself and her family. Governor Hickenlooper and the bill sponsor say House Bill 1224 bans all magazines with removable floor plates or end caps. And the majority of handgun magazines have removable floor plates. Most handguns will not work without a magazine. So this bill bans more than magazines. It effectively bans the handguns to which they attach. Banning the ordinary magazines women use every day for lawful self-defense makes our handguns useless. And it makes us more vulnerable to violent crime. Thank you. Our next speaker is Don Shawcroft, president of the Colorado Farm Bureau. Good morning. I am Don Shawcroft, president of the Colorado Farm Bureau and a fourth generation rancher from the San Luis Valley. Farm Bureau is engaging in this lawsuit because of the effects of these laws on Colorado farms and ranches, their families, their businesses, and their way of life. The Second Amendment is an important consideration in this lawsuit. It is important to member families of Colorado Farm Bureau and literally sacred to many citizens of rural Colorado. We believe that it is a citizen's right to keep and bear arms as guaranteed by the Second Amendment. We strongly oppose any law that would erode that right. Many of our farmers and ranchers need access to firearms to protect their livestock from predators, especially during the springtime when most young are born. They also need access to firearms to protect themselves and their families. Because in rural areas, law enforcement is spread very thin and very seldom is there an officer just around the corner. Most farms and ranches in Colorado are owned and operated by families, which may include several generations, aunts, uncles, cousins, in-laws, or stepchildren. Many of these family operations are incorporated as LLCs or family partnerships or other partnerships that may include non-family members. Requiring background checks for transfers between these partners creates an unfair burden to farmers and ranchers as there are not very many FFLs available to perform these background checks in rural areas. In addition, many of the people in rural Colorado engage in hunting and recreation recreational shooting. <clears throat> These activities take place certainly among family members, but not only family members. They include neighbors and friends. This bill would limit the ability of sportsmen to loan their weapons to their hunting partners. It means a farmer cannot loan a firearm to a friend, a friend, without a background check. It makes youth hunting and sporting 
activities very difficult to encourage. It creates a patchwork of confusion for thousands of hunters who enjoy recreation on the open vistas that are provided in Colorado by farmers and ranchers. The law banning magazines that hold more than 15 rounds unknowingly and I believe unintentionally criminalizes an otherwise law-abiding citizen. As has already been stated, nearly every magazine has been designed to quote, be readily converted and limits the ability of a farmer or a rancher to protect himself, his family, and or his livestock. <clears throat> a ban on the number of rounds that a magazine can hold could in fact mean the difference between life and death. If a farmer or rancher needs to take the time to reload his weapon when a predator such as a bear is advancing on him himself or his livestock, he could potentially take too long and lose his life or those of his livestock. The, the requirements of these laws are unreasonable and, as already, has already been stated as well, may be nearly impossible for citizens to comply with. When the legislature passed these bills, they were aiming at criminals, but hit the law-abiding citizens, farmers, ranchers, and rural residents of Colorado. These bills are bad for Colorado, and that is why we are engaging in this lawsuit against the state. Thank you. Our next speaker is El Paso County Sheriff Terry Makita. <clears throat> well, good morning. I'm El Paso County Sheriff Terry Makita. Today is truly a historic day in the state of Colorado. And like Sheriff Cook, I could not be more honored to stand alongside my fellow sheriffs. Sadly, we are here today because of the reckless manipulation of our lawmaking process. When transparency and public input are ignored, bad laws are enacted. These laws have no factual basis or supporting empirical evidence. When a law broadly targets law-abiding citizens at a greater proportion than criminals, it's a bad law. When the laws violate citizens' freedoms and rights, it's a bad law. When the governor admits it's unenforceable, it's a bad law. Let me share an example of the overreaching abuse of these laws and how law-abiding citizens will be criminalized. I have a very good friend of mine that is a member of our military. He has been deployed numerous times to fight terrorism abroad and restore the freedoms and rights to citizens in foreign countries. We were sitting around the table one day several weeks ago talking about his upcoming deployment and these new bills that were at the time being signed by the governor. His, what, his uh, fiance asked me, Sheriff, why, why, why do you have issue with, these, with this background law? And I turned to my friend Troy and I said, you're gonna be deployed, are you gonna leave a firearm for your fiance? He immediately replied, absolutely. Almost simultaneously, she said he better. Now keep in mind, it's a fiance, they're not married but they do share a residence. <clears throat> he was shocked, as was she, to find out that if he left a firearm for her while he is off serving our country, they would be committing a crime. I then asked him if his magazine contained more than 15 rounds, at which he said it did. I asked him, does it have a removable base plate, which he said it did. They were not only shocked, but even more angered to find out that not only would they violate the background law, they would also violate the magazine ban law. He would be leaving this weapon for her to protect herself while he is off serving our country. I must ask, are these the people that we should be targeting and criminalizing? The answer is no, but that's what these new laws will do. We should focus on the criminals and hold them responsible for their actions. 
not diminish the rights of our citizens and criminalize them. Today represents a line in the sand. Today, 54 sheriffs stand side by side and defend the rights and freedoms of our citizens of this state. The filing of this lawsuit is our only option. We did not ask for this, we did not want this, but we will not stand by silently while good citizens are deprived of their rights and criminalized. We each took an oath. The line in the sand has been drawn and we will stand united. Thank you. And our final speaker is Larimer County Sheriff Justin Smith. Thank you, David. I'm here today partially because as these laws came through in recent months and sheriffs stood up to speak against the way they were written and the concerns, we were reassured by the proponents of these laws that not to worry, they had good intent. The citizens were told these have noble intent. When the errors in their drafting were pointed out, we were encouraged to simply look past that noble intent. We as sheriffs know the intent of the law is not what's going to be applied on the citizens. It's the word of the law. These laws are absolutely flawed. As a sheriff whose community suffered tremendous wildfires over the last year, where tens of thousands of acres of my county burned, hundreds of homes were destroyed, and thousands of residents were evacuated at sometimes only moments notice. Many of my citizens' rural areas packed up what few belongings they could in their vehicles, and they fled. Many of those took with them their treasured firearms. The way these laws were authored, the way they were signed by the governor, when they take those firearms and temporarily transfer them, take them to a friend's house for safekeeping, they will become criminals under Colorado law. When they take a magazine that's over 15 rounds or capable of holding and being converted to more than 15 rounds, they and the person who accepted it become criminals. As sheriffs, we could stand back. Some have told us, stand back, let the citizens deal with this. This isn't your role, this isn't your duty. As you see the list of names of almost 90% of the Colorado sheriffs who came forward and the many who were here to make it today to stand by other citizens, you see that is not the case. As sheriffs, we could not stand idly by when we saw such intrusions on the rights the sacred rights of the citizens of our counties. As I finish this this morning, I simply want to offer out to the silenced majority, again, the silenced majority of local police officers, Colorado State Troopers, and yes, many federal agents who have come forward have reached out to myself and my fellow sheriffs, seen this events, put their hand out and said, thank you. Thank you for speaking up for the things that we believe but we are not allowed to come forward and say. So on behalf of the citizens, on behalf of those involved in this lawsuit, on behalf of the peace officers around this state who've sworn those sacred oaths, we will step forward, we will stand up, and we will bring justice back to the state of Colorado. Thank you. We'd be happy to take questions now from the press. David, the law is supposed to go into effect in, in July. So does the lawsuit address that? I mean, or what, do you, what do you want the courts to do? What is being filed today is the complaint, which is the first stage in a lawsuit. Uh, and that's, it sets forth our legal claims and the facts, and also explains what we would like the court ultimately uh, to do, which is to rule these laws, so these so-called laws, unconstitutional, and to say they never were laws in the first place, really. The step of asking a court to do that before the end of the case is called a motion for a preliminary injunction, and we are considering uh, the possibility of filing a motion for a preliminary injunction before July 1st on at least some of the issues in the laws. Can you crystallize the legal arguments for me? Sorry, I'm right here. Sure. The laws, for the reasons described, and for many others, violate the Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. Portions of the laws 
such as continuous possession designed to be readily converted are unconstitutionally vague and also violate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. And as applied to disabled citizens who are entitled to reasonable accommodations under Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the laws also violate the Americans with Disabilities Act. And if I'm, if I'm reading it right and I understand it correctly, the background check bill mostly draws your ire because it doesn't have enough exceptions to meet constitutional muster. Is that a fair characterization? There is a problem that the as you've heard, lots of innocent transfers, mm -hmm. temporary transfers of firearms, like leaving your guns with your neighbors when your house is burning down, are crimes under this law, punishable by 18 months in jail. In addition, we also point out that the background check system is in practice going to be very difficult for citizens to comply with because to do these, to get this permission for a temporary transfer, or a sale of firearms between friends, you have to go to a federal firearms licensee, a licensed firearms dealer. The House Bill 1229 says the maximum fee that the dealer can charge for that is $10. And based on our research so far, there will be very few, if any, firearms dealers who are willing to undertake this time-consuming process of the paperwork, the legal risks they face when filling out the paperwork, the time it takes, the hours or days for Colorado's so-called instant background check so that in practice it may be almost impossible for citizens who want to go through the, uh, the background check process uh, for a private transfer to be able to do so. Can you talk yes. a little bit more on the 14th Amendment in particular? Because when we talked about this last yeah. time, that really stood out, the rational and clear aspect of it and why you believe this isn't in the governor's signing statement helps to support that. Sure. The, the 14th Amendment says that no state shall deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. As the courts have, I think, correctly interpreted that, it means that citizens have a right to know in advance what the laws are so they can comply with them and the laws have to be things that they actually can comply with. So you couldn't enact a law that says everybody must be seven feet tall. You likewise can't enact a law that says everybody must, when leaving your gun uh, at the neighbor's house after you're fleeing your burning home, you've got to go to a firearms dealer and have the background check done when in fact uh, there's no firearms dealers in your area who will do that background check for you for the measly fee of $10. And likewise, people are entitled to clarity in the law. The language about design to be readily converted either means what it literally says and what the sponsor and what the governor has said it means, which is the mo a massive ban on magazines, plainly violating the Second Amendment, or if it, viol it means something less or different than that, then nobody can really tell what it means and it's unconstitutionally vague. Likewise, the requirement that grandfathered magazines be under continuous possession either means what it seems to literally say, which is Dylan can't hand a rifle, which has a magazine with a removable end cap, to someone for 10 minutes while Dylan gets in and out of a vehicle, or it means something different from that and is and nobody knows what that is and it's unconstitutionally vague. How quickly or how slowly do you see this whole process going under the court system? <laughs> we hope quickly, but federal courts are, are often very busy. So uh, uh, I, I guess I wouldn't have a guideline on that. But I, I certainly, including the potential of an appeal, uh, by one side or the other to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, this could easily be a case that goes on for years. Yeah, didn't the law um, include some sort of a 72 hour exception for um, the continuous possession? Two different things. On, for the transfer of guns, there is a 72 hour exemption. For magazines, no exemptions at all. Grandfathered magazines must be under continuous possession period, that's the end of it. Okay, but background checks there is, uh, you could, um, you know, say you had a, a gun with a 10-round magazine, 
you could hand it to somebody to help as you're getting out of the truck. Not if not if the magazine has removable base plate, like almost all magazines do. That's a that's that ten round magazine, the five round magazine, the three round magazines that have removable base plates are all banned under Representative Fields and the governor's explanations of this bill. And so, therefore, if he's if anybody has the uh, a hunting rifle with a three round magazine, like which like most three round magazines has the removable base plate, and then you hand that rifle with the magazine in it to anybody for any reason. You violated the magazine ban, and you're both criminals. I'm just trying to clarify this this line of argument has to do with the magazine bill and not the background check bill. Is that um, this, this yeah? The, the background check bill has some exceptions, which do allow some temporary transfers, and it's it's good that it does. The magazine bill has absolutely zero exceptions for any reason. I know mean, that, that was something that uh, mystified a lot of people was, you know, we're going to the bill sponsor asking how is this going to be interpreted and there's not really uh, a clear delineated how this has to be administered. Is that one potential outcome of the lawsuit is that the court would say, okay, here's how this can be enforced with limits? Conceivably. Courts are not supposed to rewrite the bills and then say, well, what they meant to do, and if they'd been competent, they would have written it this way, and so we're, that's, that's what the law will be. A court doesn't have the power to do that. But a court can say, you may not apply the bill, the law, in the, follow, in a, the following type of situations. That, that's certainly one thing a, a court might do. David, the, the court could just accept the governor's signing statement. Would that be satisfactory to the sheriffs if they just accepted the governor's signing statement and said, this clarifies it, we'll put this in the books? The governor, when he signed these, when he knowingly signed these flawed bills, said that he would work with, uh, for the creation of guidance uh, for the enforcement of these laws. And which, as Sheriff Cook said, that's a euphemistic way of saying actually what these bills really say is clearly unreasonable, so I'm going to uh, oversee the creation of guidance which will tell law enforcement, oh, don't enforce the law as it's actually written in certain situations. but. All that is, is it's called guidance for a reason. It is not legally binding. Nothing the governor's office or the attorney general's office or the uh, Colorado Department of Public Safety produces as a guidance document can order the Denver Police Department or any other police department or any local sheriff's department or any law enforcement, local law enforcement anywhere in the state. That guidance is not binding. It is merely a suggestion, and it can be changed any time uh, by any future uh, government officials. So a non-binding promise not to enforce the law uh, in certain situations is not a satisfactory solution to a law that is, in its actual statutory language, patently unconstitutional. The argument against your constitutional challenge is that the government can limit time, place, and manner of constitutional rights, and that in this case they are doing so similar to how they banned sawed-off shotguns and automatic weapons. Yeah, I, and I think your your argument gets exactly to one of the key legal issues in the case, and it's why the court, it's why the legislature failed to follow the guidelines the District of Columbia versus Heller had set forth in finding the D.C. handgun ban unconstitutional, and then in McDonald versus Chicago, finding the Chicago handgun ban unconstitutional. What the Supreme Court said is you may not prohibit arms which are typically owned by law-abiding persons for lawful purposes. So if you've got arms that are in that category, and, and that includes magazines, that's the end of the case, in our view of the case, the legal issues. At the same time, the court said you can ban things that are the opposite of commonly used uh, by law-abiding persons for lawful purposes. The opposite of that is what the court calls dangerous and unusual weapons. And is exactly as you say, the paradigm examples cited by the court are machine guns and sawed-off shotguns. And as we will present to the court, all the arms we're talking about are in that first category where Heller and McDonald versus Chicago plainly rule out prohibition. A pistol with a 17 round magazine is not some dangerous and unusual weapon that's only used by gangsters 
or terrorists or, or nuts. It is a very good choice for a law-abiding citizen for lawful protection. It's very commonly chosen by law-abiding citizens for lawful protection and for precisely the same reasons that the sheriffs and their deputies so often choose similar weapons because they are the best tools in so many situations for the protection of innocent lives, for the, for the protection of self and others. But what about a 100 round magazine? Is that a commonly used thing? Is this just that lawmakers went too far with 15 too low, but 100 rounds is a dangerous, well, unusual weapon? Our lawsuit is about the law that was, the statute that was actually passed. Uh, I think if the legislature had banned 100 round magazines, my guess is you wouldn't see 54 sheriffs standing up here. What they did is they set the ban at 15 on the one hand, and then they set the ban at everything less than 15 on the other. Uh, that's the law that they enacted, and that's the law that's unconstitutional. I think what you're getting at, though, is it, is it the number of rounds, or is it the removable base plate and all these other issues that aren't delineated in the length? Well, it, it, it's, it's, both are defects in the law, and certainly in, in our complaint, which will be online later today, we say that certainly very clearly in the category of commonly owned by uh, law-abiding citizen for lawful purposes is handgun magazines up to 20 and rifle magazines up to 30. We don't have a uh, position on numbers larger than that because for purposes of the case we don't need to. The, law, the, the House Bill 1224 clearly goes over the constitutional lines just at those numbers I've delineated without even having to get into the issue of you know, what about 35 or 40 or, or whatever? Sheriff Makita, maybe you can speak to this. Um, if this is going to drag out in the courts for who knows how long, you guys are still going to have to live with it, I guess. Um, are you ready to do that? And are you ready to live with these laws for as long as it takes for the courts to resolve this situation? I mean, how are you seeing that? Well, this is the process that we have to follow, so absolutely. If it is drawn out, we'll be here. And it's no different than the uh, criminal cases that we initiate that last throughout an entire career in some cases. Uh, the, the, the wheels of justice are not known for speed and we'll work within that system and that's been our intent all along is to use the system that's in place to have our voice heard and our concerns expressed. Sir, do you intend to enforce the law though? This drags out for years and years to enforce this law or do you choose not to enforce it? Well, it's not a matter of whether, uh, I'll speak for myself, it's not a matter of whether I choose to enforce it or not. It's unenforceable, which is one of our key elements. Uh, the scenario I gave with the soldier that is a friend of mine, um, I doubt I'm going to go down the street each time I know he's deployed and ask him to present me a background check because I have more important things to do, and he's not a threat to society. He's a threat to terrorists not to citizens in our community. <laughs> so the, the question is kind of a circular question that there is no answer. I can't enforce what is unenforceable, which is part of our lawsuit. David, you said that you were considering filing a motion for a preliminary injunction. Can you tell me why you're just not going to go ahead and do that? Well, we, when you file a motion for a preliminary injunction, you carry a, a very heavy burden, uh, and the court has to draw many presumptions against whoever's filing for a preliminary injunction. So we'll be analyzing that in the in the coming weeks about the uh, the possibilities on the various issues in the case on a preliminary injunction. Oh, and I should say I believe the lawsuit has actually been electronically filed in federal district court, so the case has now commenced. <coughs>